Thank you. As you can see on the board, or on the screen there, it's a shameless plug for the book. Um, the, there was a slight correction in the title, which I've been assured on the proof will actually uh, be the Dolce Morte rather than the Dolce Morta, the sweet death rather than the sweet dead woman. Um, what I'm doing in this presentation is um, some, some notes from my conclusion, uh, doing a close textual analysis of a particular film, Torso, and how within this particular film I think we can see the seeds that will give birth to the American and Canadian slasher films by the late 1970s and the early 1980s. So, Torso, Sergio Martino's 1973 Giallo film, features most of the standard tropes and narrative devices which are typical in the genre. Harkening back to Jonathan Rosenbaum's review of the film from the monthly film bulletin, he noted that this particular film, quote, supplies us with everything it thinks we need. Well, Rosenbaum's review is one of the few semi-positive reviews on the Jalo films when they came out. His affection for the film is based primarily on the assumptions that Martino's film aims to please its audience. And as a Jalo, pleasing the audience requires being sufficiently grounded within the filone to act as a landmark for the terza visione and European horror fan audiences. I had to cut out what those terms mean for time. Do ask me in the questions. For example, while the English language title Torso is suitably exploitive, the film's Italian title keeps to the tradition of Baroque and bizarre names, and apologies for my appalling Italian. I corpi presentano tracci di violenza carnale. Literally, the body presents signs or traces of sexual violence. So seeing a film like Violenza Carnale, as it was abbreviated throughout Europe, clearly keys to the kind of film that it is. Well, the second half of the film takes place mostly within the grounds of an isolated villa, which is rare but not completely unique within G Jolly Cinema. The first part takes place very definitely within the urban spaces of an Italian city. The dramatis personae of the film are stock characters from the Giallo. There's Jane in the top corner there, an American studying art history in Italy, Daniela, the rich and beautiful co-ed who is being stalked by Stefano, an obsessed lover with violent sexual tendencies, and Gianni, who I don't have a picture of, a creepy peddler who sold the killer an incriminating scarf and later resorts to blackmail. Then there's Roberto, the hunky doctor who saves the day. The killer himself wears, um, so it doesn't come out terribly well on that, who wears the dark leather driving gloves and a balaclava, although this one is actually a white balaclava. The list of suspects includes Stefano, who everyone in the film believes is the killer, Two motorcycle driving students who take Carol, one of the victims, to a party on the outskirts of time, uh, to an outskirts of town, and for a while anyway, possibly even creepy Johnny until he tries to blackmail the killer. Savvy fans of the genre might pick up on the very minor character of Daniela's father, who suggests that she and her girlfriends go to the isolated family villa in order to escape the murderer on the loose. Um, but that turns out to be a red herring. For most of the film, however, Stefano is the prime suspect. He is definitely stalking Daniela, owns a scarf similar to the one the police are looking for in connection with an earlier murder, and in a throwaway line, has known Daniela since they were very little. Ultimately, the killer turns out to be the girl's um, art history professor, Franz, who had been romancing Jane. Franz had been traumatized as a child when he witnessed his brother fall to his death trying to rescue a little girl's doll. Since the girl had promised to lift her dress for Franz's brother in exchange for getting the doll, Franz has since equated heterosexuality with the death of his brother and that all women were dolls. Although much is, of, much is made with, the, uh, uh, with that psychosexual explanation in Franz's background, the real reason for the murders is that Franz participated in a menage a trois which opened the film, which is sort of a blurry image in the lower corner there, and the two women involved, Carol and Flo, were the first to be murdered as they were blackmailing him with pornographic pictures taken at the time. But Daniela saw Franz follow Carol just before she was murdered, and although she could not recall who she saw follow her friend, she did recall the scarf she, w she was wearing. Daniela was killed because she was a potential witness. Their friends, Katya and Ursula, were killed because they happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Missing from the proceeding is, of course, the central role of the amateur detective. While not all Jolly have amateur detectives, like the Poliziotto or the Suspense Jolly, different characters take on different parts of the amateur detective role. While Jane is not the film's amateur detective, she is the one to put the incriminating pieces together to accuse Stefano and races off to warn Daniela at the villa. 
although Dr. Roberto is the one who ultimately kills Franz, he is only brought into play in the final act of the film, worried as to know, worried why no one has answered the door when he knew for certain Jane could not have walked out of there. She had broken her ankle um, previous to that and he was the one who taped it up. In the urban sequences of the first half of the film, the police do seem to be on the ball under the leadership of Inspector Martino. That's very rare that you have uh, the police actually on the ball in these films. But once the action moves to the villa, the police completely disappear from the narrative. Now, from a strictly narrative perspective, Martino and co-screenwriter Ernesto Gastaldi have fashioned a highly typical giallo narrative. Of course, Martino is able to include various set pieces, both sexual, like the opening menage a trois, and a lovely uh, a lesbian sequence with Ursula and Katya. There's also suspense sequences, like Carol being stalked in the marsh or Gianni being run down. But what marks Torso as a different kind of giallo is the almost 23-minute suspense sequence Martino concludes the film with, as Jane wakes up to discover her friends murdered, the killer still present, and a game of cat and mouse begins between potential victim and killer. And this sequence in particular is what marks Torso as a prototypical slasher film. By the second half of the film, once Daniela and her friends go off to the villa, Torso shifts gears. While typical of the giallo, the murders in the first half of the film are on screen, Flo, Carol, and Gianni. When the killer comes calling on the villa, Four murders happen off camera and at once. We are denied any of the traditional pleasures of this kind of cinema as four of the main characters, Stefano, Ursula, Katya, and Daniela, are murdered. Jane wakes up the next morning, comes downstairs, and finds the bodies strewn across the floor. The killer, unaware Jane was in the house, is slowly and methodically cutting up the bodies for burial around the house. This device allows Jane to find all the bodies before Franz returns, at which point she hides and witnesses him cutting the bodies down with a hacksaw. When Franz and Jane begin to play cat and mouse throughout the house, Jane's role begins to form into the role Carol Clover identified as the final girl of the slasher tradition. In this cat and mouse game, while never engaging in phys full physical struggle, Jane is attempting to outwit Franz, another aspect of the, final, of the final girl that Jane displays. Although the final girl is often responsible for the killing of the monster or killer in the slasher film, Jane, as a prototype of this character role, still needs the traditional giallo hero to arrive at the 11th hour for the final punch-up that will ultimately send Franz off a cliff to his death. 